okay and I want you guys to think about this following problem so let's say you are an army commander in World War Z or Battle Beyond the Wall or Battle of Five Armies okay and one of the ways by which you win a war is have a lot of energy and one of the ways of having a lot of energy is to transport oil all over the place okay so the problem that you're facing is you have barrels or you have a person who can make barrels and the cost of building a barrel depends on the surface area of the barrel because that's the amount of material that gets used but the amount of stuff you put in a barrel depends on the volume of the barrel okay and so if you want to minimize the cost of transporting oil from point A to point B in order to win the battle, what you need to do is maximize volume such that the area is some constant. Okay? Right? So that's how you can transport maximum amount of oil uh, from point A to point B with minimum cost because the cost depends on the area of the area of the container and let's formulate this problem mathematically so I have a cylinder okay so the volume is can someone tell me what the volume is D you want to call it D D and this is my R radius so the volume is pi r square d the area is 2 pi r uh, the area is 2 pi r square plus 2 pi r d okay and so we have a problem that looks like I want to maximize pi r square d such that 2 pi r square plus 2 pi r d is equal to I don't know 10 okay and this maximization is over r and d greater than or equal to 0 okay Now so far we have studied unconstrained optimization, I cannot use that tool here. We have studied optimization over convex set and we cannot use that tool here, okay? And why can't we use it? So if I plot R square plus RD 10 over 2 pi I don't know what this this thing would look like probably it will look like this okay so this is r square plus r d equals 5 over 2 pi r square plus r d equals 2 over 2 pi and then r square plus r d equals 10 over 2 pi Okay, and this is R and this is D. Okay, so your constraint set looks, it's not a convex set, it's just this line. Okay, so the constraint set is this line. You're maximizing a function over this particular line. And it's not a convex set, it's not an unconstrained set. I cannot transform this problem into an unconstrained minimization or maximization problem. So how do we solve this problem? Okay. So that's what we are trying to solve using Lagrange multiplier theory. Okay. So of course the theory is more general. You can apply it in any situation you want 
as long as things are differentiable, but the goal is to try and solve problems of this type. Wouldn't the first thing we'd want to do would be to eliminate one of the variables? Because we can... Yeah, I think you can, you can do that because, uh, because you have an equality constraint, so you can eliminate D from this equation, but then you still want R and D to be greater than zero. So that would create a nonlinear, let's, let's try and do that. Okay, so I get D equals 10 minus two pi R square, two pi R square over two pi R. And then I need R comma D greater than equal to zero. So this is greater than equal to zero. Do I get a linear problem? I think so. No, I don't. I actually, wait a second. So I have this as 10 over 2 pi r is greater than or equal to r. So I have 2 pi r square greater than or equal to, no, less than or equal to. So yes, you are right. You can actually transform it into a into a equivalent problem, which is so this can be transformed into max of pi r square ten minus two pi r square over two pi r such that zero less than or equal to r less than or equal to square root of 10 over 2. Okay, so okay, so in this case you can transform this problem into a problem over a convex set, but in general you could have constraints where the constraint set itself is non-convex and therefore you cannot really transform the problem in this uh, simple, in this simple uh, fashion. Okay, sorry my bad. So this problem can certainly be converted into a, into an equivalent problem. Uh, but let's 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 say that I don't want to do this transformation. Okay, I still want to look at the problem in the original space, and I have this constraint set that is non-convex, and I want to come up with methods to solve this problem. So how do we do that? So now we have a problem where I want to minimize f of x such that hi of x is equal to zero for i equals one to r. Okay, I have r equality constraints, hi x equal to zero, and I have some objective function, and x is an rn. And I'm going to assume that all these functions are differentiable and smooth and all that nice properties. So what does Lagrange multiplier theorem says? Let's, uh, let's try to visualize what this problem is trying to say. I have the surface h i o x equals zero. Professor. Yes. And, and then and transforming it into the minimization problem is just making it a negative of Yes, of, the, okay. of course. And that doesn't do anything to our constraints? No, all? no, it doesn't. Yes, you had a question? No, okay. Um, okay, so this is my, let's say I have two constraints. So this is my h1 x <coughs> equal to zero. I have another constraint this is my h2 x equal to 0 and I am looking to minimize the function where the two surfaces intersect so that's this line Okay, 
and I want to minimize this function f over this black line okay because that's the black line where h1 of x is equal to 0 and h2 of x is also equal to 0 okay so imagine you have two curved surface in the space they intersect along some curve right and we want to minimize the function where these two surfaces are actually intersecting okay So Lagrange multiplier theorem, uh, I'm going to introduce it in a bit and then we will go about proving it. But I need to introduce two definitions. So the first definition I want to introduce is that of regularity. So X is regular. if and only if gradient of h1 x all the way up to gradient of h uh, hr x are linearly independent And the other definition is first order feasible variation. So V of X is the set of D such that gradient of H I X transpose d equals to 0 for all i equals 1 to, one to r. So, yes. So, is that a statement we make at x of interest for all x for each x? x? So, this is just defined for every x. So, you could have non regular x and you could have regular x within your constraint set. Okay. So, we, we just say x is regular around these bounds. Right. right. Okay. Yes. What would it look like if the two of the gradients were parallel? I'll show you a picture. Let's say I have these constraints, x1 minus 1 square plus x2 square equals 1, x1 minus 2 square plus x2 square equals 4, and these are, this is 1, this is 2, so I draw a circle around 1, and then I draw a bigger circle with centered at 2 and when are these two points equal when are so what's the intersection of these two h1 x and h2 of x equal 0 so that's this point origin okay now if I look at the normal to this particular sphere the larger sphere that's in this direction and the normal to the second sphere that's also in this direction okay and so that's why these two this x is not regular okay let's uh, let's look at it from expression itself yes so 
So if x is regular, or the first order feasible uh, variation in set should only be zero, correct? No. Uh, so x is an Rn, and this is Hr. So, so the first order feasible variation would be oh, of dimension n minus r. Okay. Okay. So let me define my h1 of x as x1 minus 1 square plus x2 square minus 1. Let me define h2 of x as 4 minus x1 minus 2 square minus x2 square equal to 0. Let's take the gradient of h1 at 0. Uh, remember that this x should be in the constraint set. So all the h has to be equal to 0 for us to define regularity. So h1 of what is, so in this case, 0 is the only point that satisfies uh, both these constraints together. So let's compute what h1, the gradient of h1 at 0 is. Can someone uh, tell me what the gradient is? 2x1 minus 1 and 2x2 evaluated at 0. So that's minus 2 and 0. Right? All of you agree with it? Perfect. Let's see what the gradient of h2 at 0 is. That's minus 2 x1 minus 2 and minus 2 x2 evaluated at 0, 4, 0. Okay, and these two are linearly dependent. So 0 is not regular. Okay, and you see what's, what's happening is both the surfaces, wherever they are meeting, they are actually tangential to each other, and therefore their uh, uh, their derivatives are not linearly independent. They are linearly dependent. Yes? Yes, they are linearly dependent, right? If you multiply this by negative 2, you get this vector. No, I was, yeah, so I made my, uh, I was saying not linearly independent, and then I realized there's no point of saying such a long word, so I said linearly dependent, okay? So, yeah. Yes. So, uh, if, if um, the constraint sets uh, that need to be equal to zero is satisfied for set S, mm -hmm. as, do we say, uh, and, and it's regular, do we say X is regular over S, S, or do we say X is regular for all R, but the only region of interest is X? No, you cannot define regularity for all Rn because there is only this line segment that's of interest. So it would be x is regular over yes. s? Yes. Okay. Um, but, but you don't, well, I, I've never seen this statement x is regular over the set. You just say that x is regular. Okay? So regularity is the definition for a point, not for a set. Okay. okay. So we wouldn't have a theorem that said uh, if x has a set s, uh, hmm. all x in that set s is regular, therefore for all x. No, I no, it's not okay. like that. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's one one thing. So what's regularity? I've expressed what regularity is. If you look at this, these two surfaces, your gradient of H two is in this direction. Your gradient of H one is in this direction, and therefore they are not. Uh, they are linearly independent. Okay, these two vectors are linearly 
uh, independent and therefore this point is regular. Okay, in fact, all these points are regular because if you draw the two derivatives, you will see that they are all linearly independent. Now, what is the first order feasible variation? So let's go back to this figure. I can't define first order feasible variations here because it's not regular, but actually I can define the first order feasible variations are these two directions because that's orthogonal to the derivative of h. And in this case, the first order feasible variations are these directions d because they are orthogonal to both the gradients. Okay, So this is gradient 1, this is gradient 2, and these purple lines are actually orthogonal to both the gradient of h1 and the gradient of h2 at that particular point. Okay, so that's the direction D. This is D. Now one thing that I want to note is, let me zoom in at this point. So your, your surface, black surface, looks something like this. And you are standing at this point X. The first order feasible directions are vectors, so this is x plus d, and this is x plus, or x minus d. Okay, so no matter how small a step you take in the direction of d or in the direction of negative d, you will go out of the set. Okay, you're not within the set. So, so far we have always said, oh, let me take a step in that direction and I'm not going out of the set so I don't have to worry. Now, we are going out of the set, no matter how small of a step we take, but it's fine. Okay. Uh, yes. Why are we guaranteed to go out of the set? I, I well, you're that. not guaranteed. It, in this particular example, since the curve is has a positive curvature, that's why you okay, so will be going. Example, we yeah. Are guaranteed yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. For this particular example, you're guaranteed to go out. Okay. So now we have. We have introduced both the definitions, regularity and first order feasible direction. So let's look at what Lagrange multiplier theorem says. It's a necessary condition for optimality. So necessary conditions for optimality x star optimal and regular implies there exist Lagrange multipliers lambda 1 to lambda r star such that gradient of f at x star plus summation lambda i star gradient of h i evaluated at x star i equals 1 to r is equal to 0. This is the first order necessary condition. The second order necessary condition says that D transpose the second derivative is greater than equal to 0 for all d in V 
x star. Yes. And are these is necessary but not sufficient conditions? And because as, uh, we would generate with the converse to say that we can form Lagrangian multipliers and it is regular, therefore it may be optimal? I think the, so I will go over the sufficient conditions later on. Uh, you know, just like in the, in the unconstrained optimization case, we will have a strict e inequality here for every d in vx star such that d is not equal to zero. Okay, but I think there are some more conditions. Uh, we'll get to it when the time comes. Okay, we'll talk about sufficient conditions later on. Okay, so remember this is not saying that this is positive definite. The sum of these two matrices are positive definite. What it is saying is in some directions it is positive definite, in other directions it may be whatever, negative definite, positive definite, I don't know. Okay. So, what is the first order necessary condition saying? Okay, so remember I drew this gradient of H1 and the gradient of H2. Give me a second. Yeah. I'm sorry. Did you say positive definite or positive semi-definite? Uh, I mean, I meant positive semi-definite. Okay. okay. Not positive definite. Okay. So let's go back to the first order necessary condition. So I have this gradient of H1, gradient of H2. Let's say this is my X star. What the first order necessary condition is saying look at the plane spanned by the gradient of h1 and gradient of h2 right so that plane would be something like this okay so this is like a circle or a or a plane that is passing through this point x star and what this is saying is gradient of f of x star actually lies in that particular plane so this would be your gradient of f at x star Okay, so that will lie in this particular plane which is spanned by the gradient of H1 and gradient of H2. Okay, that's what the first order necessary condition says. And the second order necessary condition says that you are at this point X star, you go in this direction or you go in this direction, your uh, function increases along or not, not increases because this is greater than equal to sign, so it could either stay the same or it could increase if you move along these two directions. Okay, yes. Can I have an optimal point that isn't regular? I mean, you can construct examples like that. Let me, let, let me construct this example. Okay, I want to minimize x1 such that x1 minus 1 square plus x2 square is equal to 1 and x1 minus 2 square plus x2 square equals 4. Right. So we know that this is a not regular point but the minimum is, is this just one point in the set so that obviously that is the minimum no matter what the objective function is. Okay, so just yes. Can't yes. It is just that you cannot say anything about it. Okay. In fact, let me add x1 plus x2. So even though you remember that gradient of h1 and h2 are in this direction, the gradient of the function is actually in this direction. Right? So that's gradient of f at x and this is gradient of h1 of x. Right? So gradient of fx is not in the same plane as gradient of h1 of x. Okay, 
So I have this curve in this space where both these constraints are satisfied. I look at the plane that cuts the curve at orthogonally, like at 90 degrees, and my gradient of f should lie within that particular plane. Okay, so that's the idea here. Now, looking at these two, these two expressions, we would like to define a function called the Lagrangian. which is defined as, so this is the Lagrangian. You know, you might have studied Lagrangian in the context of physics, maybe some early physics course. Uh, but but this, that Lagrangian is different from the Lagrangian that we are defining here. So this Lagrangian is L of x comma lambda, which is f of x plus lambda transpose h of x. So h is defined as, H1 all the way up to HR. So this is the Lagrangian. And based on this expression, I can define the first order necessary condition as gradient with respect to x, L of x star lambda star equal to zero. And second order necessary condition is D transpose the second derivative of L The second derivative of L evaluated at x star and lambda star is greater than or equal to zero for all d in V of x star. Okay, questions, yeah. Yeah, so uh, all the Lagrangians, are they vectors? No, the Lagrangians are. Are you saying transpose? Oh, oh, Lagrangian multipliers, sorry. Yes, so, so lambda, no. So each of this is scalar, but lambda is lambda 1 to lambda r. Okay. Okay. Similarly, h is h1 to hr. Okay, so this is h is a function from rn to rr. Okay, that's why this makes sense. Okay. Any any questions so far? Okay, so this is an extremely powerful theorem. Okay, most of the optimization is optimization theory and optimization algorithms that are used in practice are based on this particular theorem. One, one important point to note here is, is that I'm not, so let's say you want to point, let's say somebody told you the precise value of lambda i star, okay, for all i. All you need to do, so I, I know lambda star already, all I need to do is find a point x star that satisfies this expression, right? And that's exactly, what does gradient descent do? Gradient descent finds a point where the derivative of the function vanishes, okay? So most of the Lagrange multiplier methods that we will talk about in subsequent classes are essentially trying to find a point x star and a point lambda star that satisfies this expression, okay? And that's what will get us to the optimal point.
point, or rather a candidate for an optimal point. So what was the original problem for our Lagrange's approach to this? I don't know. Okay. So I think Lagrange was uh, writing papers back in 1800s. I don't have access to those papers. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure if I go to Thompson Library, you know, I've been to Thompson Library and I've found books that were written in 1800s. Okay, so maybe Lagrange's paper is there in that library hidden somewhere, I don't know. If it is, I think it would be easier to the find on the website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll give you that as an assignment, okay? You can probably share it with the whole class, wherever he proved this particular result. So there are many different ways to find out um, what the lambda star is, right? Because if we start from yes. nothing, we first have yes. to know what the lambda is. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yes. So we will study various algorithms, which uh, tries to update lambda in certain way and x in certain way, so that eventually we converse to a point x star lambda star, so that this condition is satisfied. Okay. <coughs> So how do we go about proving this result? We want to prove this result. Okay, so what's the, what's the idea? So let me introduce some key steps in today's class so that uh, we have some time. So I'll introduce the key steps in this class so that in the next class we can go through the entire proof. And it's a very beautiful proof. So, so that's why I want to cover it in the class. So the proof is as follows. We will take the penalty approach. I am going to define a function fkx, which is fx plus k over 2 norm of hx square plus alpha over 2 x minus x star square alpha is greater than 0 k is a natural number Let me define a set S, which is X such that norm of X minus X star is less than equal to epsilon. Okay, so I have this point X star. This is the surface at which I'm minimizing the function FX. I construct another function fk of x which is defined in the entire neighborhood of x star. So remember I'm not restricting myself to the surface, I'm looking at the whole volume around x star, a small volume around x star, so this is epsilon. In uh, electrical engineering epsilon is a small number, okay? So here it's epsilon is small. So I'm looking at a small neighborhood of x star and I define a new function where I have the original function, I have a huge penalty depending upon the value of k, I have a huge penalty for violating the constraint and I have another term that makes the whole thing strictly positive definite around x star. Okay, so, so this, this term is trying to convexify the function fk of x around x star. So let me write it. This is the penalty. This is convexification. Yes. In, in what region does it convexify it around? Just epsilon or does Just it epsilon. Okay. Yeah. So in a very small region around X star, I'm trying to convexify this function. Uh, by picking a 
positive value of alpha and then multiplying it by x minus x star square. Okay, let me define x k star as argument of f k of x where x is in the set S. Okay, so my xk would be somewhere here. This is my xk star. So starting from k equals 1, I'm going to find x1 star, x2 star, 3 star, 4 star, and so on, right? I'm constructing a sequence of optimal solutions to this function fk for every value of k. k going all the way from 1 to infinity. So the first result we will prove is that limit k going to infinity of norm of h of xk star is equal to 0. Okay, so what, what am I saying? I construct a function, I construct a set around that x star, and I'm looking for the minimum point of the function within that set. I don't even know whether this, this, this sequence is actually converging to something or not. It could just be going around the space. I don't know, I have no idea. So the first result that we prove is, look, as you take k going to infinity, you're actually coming to the constraint surface hx equal to zero, okay? So the sequence is eventually converging to points that are in this particular set. So that's the first result. The second result is xk star converges to x star and x k star is strict local minimum of f k of x. Okay, so this is the important result. So what I'm saying is, look, it's not just converging to any point, or it's not just oscillating on the surface, it's actually converging to the x star, which is the optimal point by assumption. Okay, and the second thing is x k star is a strict local minimum of f k of x, which means that I can draw a ball around x k star, and x k star is a strict local minimum within that ball within that small neighborhood around x k star. So the third thing which follows from the second part is gradient of f k at x k star is equal to zero which would imply that limit k going to infinity the gradient of fk evaluated at xk star is also going to infinity. <coughs> uh, okay, this is for k sufficiently large. And then the fourth point would be d transpose d is greater than or equal to 0 for all d in vx star. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, and then I can take limit k going to infinity and then show this for the second order result, second order necessary condition. And so I want you guys to stare at these four claims for some time to understand the train of thought for proving the Lagrange multiplier theorem. Okay. Construct a sequence. First of all, consider an unconstrained, not an unconstrained, uh, I mean it's still in a neighborhood, but you can go in any direction. Okay, you're not restricted to being on this surface uh, as in the original problem. So you can go anywhere within this neighborhood. You construct a sequence, xk star, by solving this uh, augmented function by minimizing the augmented function. And then you prove that the limit of the, so in the limit, uh, the points will go on the constraint surface because we are increasing the penalty for violating the constraint. So naturally, we expect that the points should, should go on the surface after some time because the k is very, very large. The penalty becomes huge for violating the constraint. So that's one th claim. Then the second claim is, look, xk star actually converges to x star, which is the point of interest. And furthermore, after some time, this xk star actually goes inside the set, so I can construct a small neighborhood around xk star. And so xk star becomes strict local minimum of fk of x. So this is my sphere S my x star is at the center of the sphere. And when k is sufficiently large, xk has to go inside the set. And then I can draw a neighborhood around xk star. And this xk star is a strict local minimum of fk of x within this small ball. So this allows me to show that the gradient of fk at xk star is actually equal to zero because it's a strict local minimum within this neighborhood. And then I can take k going to infinity and I will get the first result, which is the first order necessary condition from this expression. And then since it is a strict local minimum, I can look at the second order necessary condition and then I can take the limit k going to infinity to arrive at the second order necessary condition for this Lagrange multiplier theorem. Okay? Yes? Here? This is capital F. Okay. Capital F. Okay, so even though I have time, I don't want to proceed further with this proof. Uh, I think this is, oh, there are a couple of questions in yeah, the back. Um, question is, uh, another question is, um, is the fourth claim a result of the convexification of the third term? Is that where that comes from? Uh, I think so, yes. Because that's a convexification. But, but not, not only the convexification, uh, this, is, this is the second order necessary condition for optimality, right? Uh, but I guess we are using the fact that the function is convex around xk star. So, so yes, I think there is both convexification and second order necessary condition for optimality uh, in order to prove this result. Uh, is f bounded or any other Which f? F, f, f of x. Oh, f of x. Yeah. Uh, bounded as in we are not considering unbounded functions. So I, I don't understand your question. So f is the range of that. Oh, range could be unbounded, of course. Fx equals to x square. The range is unbounded, right? But do you assume that it's reasonably smooth Lipschitz conditions or anything? Lipschitz. So I'm assuming that the function and all its derivatives exist. Okay, so it's sufficiently smooth. I mean, at the very least, you want second order uh, derivatives to exist and be continuous. Okay, that's the very minimal requirement uh, for this class. Um, 
Why does the third term convexify the function? Oh, that's a good point. So let's say I have a function that looks like this, okay? And I call this as my x star. And then I add this penalty term, which looks something like this, okay? And then I look at the sum of both these functions. So this is my f of x, and this is my alpha norm of x minus x star square. So the, if you sum these two functions, you will actually get something like But okay, let me make it non-convex. Okay, so this is a non-convex function now. But by picking a value of alpha sufficiently large, you can make sure that the final function looks something like this. Okay, so you want, of course, this alpha to be very, very large in order for the function to look sufficiently convex, okay? And this value of alpha would depend on what the slope of the function looks like around this point x star. I'm assuming there's a proof somewhere for that. Yeah, the yeah. Okay. It's used in a lot of optimization algorithms too you know, to convexify the function around the point where you are standing at this moment. Any other question? Yes. So what is the relation between the minimum point of L and the optimal solution to the original problem? Okay, so we are not minimizing L at this moment, right? This is just the first derivative of L. I haven't yet mentioned that X star is a minimum of the Lagrangian. Uh, I mean, I will introduce it eventually, but right now I haven't mentioned that x star is the minimum value of the Lagrangian. It's the minimum at a specific point lambda star, right? And at that point, this x star turns out to be the same as the solution to the original problem, but that requires a proof. It's not obvious. Yes? So the convexification process, is it only guaranteed to make it convex around s? Uh, larger, uh, around x star, yeah. So the set S. Yes, so in the set S, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There was a question here. No? You had a question? No, I just no. Asked. Okay. Any other question? Yes. So the second term, uh, K over two is that K the same with uh, that uh, S, uh, the K in the X K? You mean uh, if the K increases, then the the first, uh, yeah, yeah, this one, k over 2 will go to infinity? Unless you are at the surface. Okay, so at this surface, h of x is equal to 0, right? So there is no penalty. But as soon as you move out of the surface, there is a huge penalty for violating the constraint when k is very, very large, right? I think the question is, for like claim number three, we have a limit as k goes to infinity. Yes. Is that little k the same as the big k there? Oh yes, yes, it's the same k. All these k's are the same, okay, they're not different. Okay, perfect, so we'll meet on Friday.